I think the sessions this morning have been mind-blowing. I've been so inspired. I don't know about you guys, but I think that Tech for Africa this year has been incredibly inspirational. Do you agree with me? Yeah. Well, the, the next speaker, and uh, I've been speaking to him very briefly, and I'm so excited to hear his message. Um, you've heard the term bandied around. People are saying that this is the uh, African version of Bill Gates. He's got an incredible story to tell us. Um, and he says he firmly believes that if Africa misses this wave that's sweeping the world with IT, if Africa misses this wave, we might not get another chance again. And he's got an incredible message about Africa, and he's very passionate about IT in Africa and creating entrepreneurs in Africa. So let's find out what he's got to say. So ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, please welcome Herman Shinery Hesse. Okay, my name is Herman Chinri Hesse. I run two companies, I'm the chairman of two companies. The first one is Soft Tribe, the other one is Black Star Line or BSL. Um, I, I, I'm Ghanaian, I went to school in Ghana, high school, and then I did my final year of high school in, uh, in Texas, believe it or not. And then I went to university, then I moved to England because I could work there legally and worked for a year and a half as a manufacturing engineer, just so I could say I have some work experience. And then I moved back to Ghana, because I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to uh, contribute to Africa's uh, renaissance, if we can call it that. So I came back and thought I was, going to be, I was going to be into manufacturing and own a factory or start a factory. And, and I realized that my parents didn't live in Ghana. They were diplomats all over the place. And the only thing I had to my name was a, a, an old PC I bought when I was in London and my bedroom from when I was a teenager. And you can't start a factory like that. And there was no credit, etc. So I sat and thought and panicked a bit and realized, wait a second, that PC that I have, it's a factory. It can make software. And I'd been tinkering around with it when I was in London as a hobby. And so um, I said, ah. I did some freelance work for some companies in the UK, you know, when I was waiting to move to Ghana. So I thought, hey, this is my chance. So I started going, you know, round and round and talking to people. Actually, I had an argument with my friends at a, at a, at a, at a nightclub and told them that uh, they, they were asking me how they could get to America. And I told them, you guys are being foolish, my, my Pan-African self. I told them, look, this is where the action is. This is where the development is. Uh, you can't tell me there's no unemployment. Look at the, the drains that are not covered, etc., etc. They were like, hey, man, you know, you've been eating too many hamburgers. We think you're going crazy. We can't find jobs, okay? You help us to get to America. And I said, I'm moving back. I can get a job by Monday. This was a Saturday night, and uh, we're drinking a bit. So we made a bet. So mo Monday morning, I woke up. And now the booze had cleared. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to lose money. So <laughs> I started making calls. I'd done some work for a travel agency in the UK. I started making calls, you know, asking who wants, a, who wants a travel agency, who wants a travel agency, who wants a travel agency. And uh, I started doing the, the rounds. And I got to one travel agency where they had a computer sitting there. In those days, it was a 386. And it was covered up like, like some you know, ornament. And they didn't have software for it. And I spoke to them. And they said, we've seen many people come like you. They bring us accounting software. We want travel software. We want a management software for a travel agency. So if you say you can do it, well, come tomorrow. So basically, I came the next day, and uh, I brought the software on diskettes and uh, set it all up. And they said, well, do it. And I showed it to them. They were like, wow, this is good. But it's got another company's name on it. Ah, you were working for them in, in London, and you stole the software, right? I said, no, I wrote it. They said, well, in, in Ghana, it's a little different. So you know, change up the screens. and do, I, can, I can do it now. I took the compiler with me. I said, I can do it now. And, and just when I was about to do it, the, the, the owner of the, there's the biggest agency in Ghana. The owner got tapped on the shoulder by his friend, one of, the, one of the workers, pulled him aside, and he came back. Young man, keep your hands off my computer. You have to promise me one thing. You have to promise not to put any bacteria on my computer. <laughs> so, what's he talking about? A virus. Oh. I said, no, don't worry, I won't, I won't. But basically, 
I, sh I proved to him it could be done. They got excited. Suddenly, I was being pulled left and right by all the departments. Everybody wanted some modification or the other. That was my entry into the Ghanaian market. This was in 1991, my entry into the Ghana market. So we expanded the system. I got a cla an old classmate, worked with him. He was doing sales and marketing. I was doing technology. And we started the company from my bedroom. And we started selling this travel system. Then the, the, the part of it that did the sales, we pulled, we pulled that segment out, the sales ledger, and started selling it as a point of sale system, which sold very well because there's no point of sale systems in the country. We started computerizing all the shops. The shop right equivalents didn't have point of sale. So we did that and we started making money. So we started hiring people and then buying other, other computers. And uh, in the early days, the first guy we hired, we still had my old, old uh, IBM XT, I think it was. And when you compile, it'll take five to 10 minutes. So we do musical chairs. When somebody goes to the bathroom, somebody gets to work, then somebody else goes, we're just basically doing musical chairs, and, that's, and we work 24 hours to get maximum use out of the computer. But we did it, and we expanded. Over three, four years, we became the biggest thing in IT in Ghana. And everything was going well. Our turnover was doubling every year. Next thing we know, we employ like 90 people, and we are doing work in Nigeria, and, and Sierra Leone, and so on. And everything was going very well. Then, we, do, we did all the multinationals, by the way, all the Nestle's and so on. We do all this, we do all this stuff. Okay. We did, there's a reason why we did all this stuff, because there was no internet. So they, they couldn't get the head office systems into Africa supported. And the Africa operations were small enough to where it didn't justify bringing in an expat. So we were having a field day, and we're doing very well with them. And then the internet came. So guess what happened? Thank you very much, but no thanks. <laughs> Go. Head office now insists they can support over the net. So they all got their satellite dishes, and we started losing that business. So we had to come up with new ideas and reinvent ourselves. Now, we went back into the lab for a few years, and we came out with a few things. In 2007, I believe, I was invited to speak at the TED conference when it was held in Tanzania. And I started talking about some of the things we were about to roll out. One of them was setting up an African eBay and an African PayPal, like an African Amazon.com, called shopafrica53.com. Because we theorized that uh, the government isn't buying products from us, because the, the donor agencies are stopping them from buying local products and saying, buy international if you're borrowing from us. So we can't enter that market, which is like 60% of the market. And then on the private sector side, we've saturated it. But the, the, the big boys, i.e. the multinationals, we've lost them. So it's not sustainable. The company isn't growing anymore. So we have to come up with these new models. And that's why we figured that if normal African businesses, SMEs, had money to spend on software, and they were doing enough transactions on the, in their businesses, then we would, they would buy our software. So we had to now go back and find out why they weren't making money. So that, like America, where 50-something percent of the tax revenue is from mom and pop shops. Africa is not like that. There's a few companies that are being taxed. I don't know about South Africa, but in my part of Africa, that's how it is. So we came up with this concept of setting up there some kind of Amazon.com, some kind of PayPal. I presented this at TED. Uh, immediately got a bunch of investors who wanted to put money in. So they gave us the money. I went back to Ghana. I had millions in my personal account within a matter of weeks. Uh, so they wanted to be involved. They said, look, we'll check you out and find, as long as we're sure you're not a crook, We'll give you the money. We don't even need paperwork yet. Then we'll sit down and discuss the paperwork. That's exactly what we did. So then we took that money and started a second company called Black Star Line. And Black Star Line does the, uh, the Amazon thing, the, the e-commerce thing. Now, the trick with that is that we don't try to own the products. We don't try to own the merchants. It's, it's a shopping mall, like whatever mall you have here, but on the web. So, what we found was that the average African had no way to sell anything to uh, anybody abroad. So we wanted to fix that problem. That was is a source of Africa's poverty. Some sharp guy sitting in a village, he's made a beautiful drum. Some guy in Sweden wants it. There's no way to do the transaction. And so we focused on making that transaction possible, uh, affordable to both sides. But then that has taken three years because we've had to get into international payment systems. There's no payment system that works in Africa. Also, for intra-Africa trade, for, for you to be able to sit in South Africa and order something from Ghana and vice versa. So all those things, we had to cure all those problems. 
to get where we are. Now, while, while working on those things, and it's been excellent. I mean, the, 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 the more we have has all the traditional African stuff. It also has the shop right types, the, the supermarkets, because people abroad can now buy things for their relatives in Africa. So it's not only for export. The whole diaspora market shopping in Africa can use our system. It can also do money transfer, right? And then it can also do Africa to Africa shopping, which is the holy grail. Nobody's ever ventured into that. It's also one of the sources of Africa's poverty. When I see the South African companies in, in Ghana and I see how much turnover they do, it's like pent up demand. The South African products we want. We like the South African wines. It's African wine, but we've never had it. So suddenly when it's coming, it sells. So we be, truly believe that the intra-Africa trade is, is wonderful and is the holy grail. So while doing that, it took longer than we thought. There were so many hurdles. And because this time we are back-end people, we are not selling the goods, it's not our products. We have to bring the merchants up to speed, drive into the bush, set up somebody, learn merchandising, it's very, very complicated. Even on the payment side, you get the permits for different countries, et cetera, et cetera, because there's nothing that was working for us. And, and lock, lock into the right banking partners and so on. It's taken three years, so we ran out of money. While waiting, we said, whoa, 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 whoa. We're running out of money, we need to do something. We had discovered, we had basically created this card technology, something called the African Liberty Card, which was the payment mechanism we set up for the payments on the website. So now we understood, and it worked on SMS or the internet. So we understood card business well, we understood internet well, we understood SMS well. So we started saying, wait a second, while waiting, let's make some money to survive. So we started rolling out products, right? First product, let me see if I have a card here. <laughs> this is, is, it's like, for people who know the UK, it's like an Oyster card for Africa. Where the Oyster card, we have to be more innovative because it's Africa. Where the Oyster card has the technology built in, it has an electronic chip. I mean, we all know, you know African market woman, sticks in here, the, the chip is gone. <laughs> so, <laughs> in the heat, you know, so basically we had to invent something that would work for Africa. So we came up with this, and it's barcoded. And we had discovered cloud computing. So the whole system runs on the cloud. So we went in, and there was a bid for a big international trade show. The biggest in Ghana is done yearly. We went in and told them, whoa, 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 relax, relax. Don't go printing any cards. Don't go putting invitations and tickets and so on, forget it. We'll do it for you and we'll take 25% of your money. They're like, you guys are not serious. I said, no, we can't do it, give, give us the deal. And since there was no money in the deal, it was a government agency, but because now there's no tender, there's nothing. So they said, okay, you can have it. Basically, we went in, we printed the cards because we knew the cards were reusable. So they're just financing our first print, <laughs> right? And they're not only reusable for, for trade fair events. The, the next day, there's a, a play at the National Theater, same card. The next day, there's a bus company that needs same card. <laughs> right. so, so we created this card. The first event we went to, the trade fair event is usually packed and all kinds of people fighting and they, they, they don't make any money because the gates guys are saying, how, how much is the ticket? Uh, Ten dollars, fine. You, you give me two, go, and, and that kind of thing. So we, we went in, they said, what about our staff, the people who usually man the gates? And they, they were all waiting, and we said, we don't need them, why? If we went and brought cameras, our friends, we do partnerships, and all these things, what I've learned is collaboration. Our friends own security companies, we go, and come, come, install cameras on all the gates, and record the whole event, 12 days, one. Two, I called my friends in London, they sent us scanners, Supermarket scanners, because we did point of sale for 15 years. We know those scanners back to front. So when you get to the door, there's a magnet <laughs> magnetic door with a scanner. Not only that, these tickets, they're for sale not only at the trade fair event, any shell shop. You can go to a shop and go and buy it. Or if you already have one, you can just reload it. You see where we're going now? We're going electronic. So usually what had happened was everybody comes in and starts a big fight. And then in the confusion, oh, let them in, let them in, there's too much confusion. So we, we, we have seen the American immigration queues and we remember them. <laughs> you buy the tickets from far away in the parking lot 
<laughs> with the queue for the tickets facing this way when the gates are that way. <laughs> so if you push, you're pushing the wrong way. <laughs> and you're going to find four, four young kids sitting behind laptops saying, next, can I help you? Next, <laughs> four softy university kids. Thank you, next, thank you. That's what they were doing. So you take your card and they say, so where do I go now? So gates one to five, go. So you walk up to the gate, what do you see? A scanner. Man, I, I, we saw people who, who had been going for, th for these events for 10 years who had never paid, suddenly being forced to pay. I mean, they are there talk, trying to talk to somebody in the room behind the scanner, but the, but the door is locked and the camera is on. And almost uh, on the verge of uh, negotiating with the scanner. <laughs> and and as, uh, as one would expect, the, the poor scanner is just struggling to contain its indifference. <laughs> just locked shut. So now, <laughs> speaking about cloud computing, because we were so afraid of sabotage, we run the whole operation of the cloud. We, we got some MTN dongles for the broadband thing and put laptops in there and connected the scanners, done. We were using the organization's broadband. They were so irritated with us because they weren't making any money, as they normally would. They turned off the broadband. They were surprised. All the guys from our organization pulled out these MTN dongles, boom, boom, boom. Within a minute, we're back on track. <laughs> now, we made it so impossible. And we had a security guy standing there. So, and US immigration queue this is the one, one time I thanked them. We put a line far away. So it's like, next. When you scan, it goes, wait, checking. Talk to our servers in Europe, enter now. Next, wait, checking. There was no fight. They made over 500% profit on that event. On one of the days, they have these events once a year, and they're usually 13, 14 days, between 12 and 14 days. On one of the days of that event, they made more money than any event in the, in the history of the, the organization since the 60s. So that is the kind of difference we made. There was no queue, there was no fight. And everybody wound up holding these cards. So you can imagine, the next day, we're talking to all the production people, people who do plays, musicians. African musicians have been having a rough time. Suddenly, they can decide to announce, uh, let's say, uh, uh, Ladies Play Black Mambazo, can decide to say, on December 8th, we're having a concert. It's on the system. You can go to a gas station and load up. Man, in November, forget December. In November, they've already got $200,000 in collections because they're already collecting the money. So the musicians can suddenly start getting rich. They haven't even done the concert yet. They'll be like, hey, this stuff is not bad, huh? Let's schedule another one for March. <laughs> and maybe I can buy a BMW. So these are the, the African-style solutions that came, up, came out as a byproduct of this long-term venture we're doing. Now, throughout the event, the Trade Fair Authority bosses, one of them was in London. He was sitting in his hotel room. We had given him a link and, and for the computer buffs. A simple screen with the statistics and a bar chart. Gate one, gate two, gate three, gate four, gate five. And he sat in his hotel room in England and he was just watching. Wow, 2012, 2013, 2014, gate one, 6002, 6002, live. He was watching it live. They were all upstairs watching live. Every now and then they'll call me, hello, Herman, Herman there's, there's $10,000 in the 10,000 CDs in, in, the, in the box. Could you bring it up, please? Because they were seeing everything live. In fact, we, we found out later that they called the ministry that controls them and gave them the link. So they were watching the event live too. Now, we thought it was very sexy. They made their money. We made our money. Of course, we made sure we got paid every night when we closed, because otherwise we would have ended up without our money. So everything was fine, and we've done it. Since then, everybody's using it, right? So that's product one. Now, these are the African technologies that uh, we talk about. Now, Product two, I'm going to pull another one. Ready? It's a strange name. It's called Quickie. <laughs> you won't believe this. We're in partnership with the Catholic Church and the insurance company. <laughs> and, 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 and they named it Quickie. <laughs> now, the Catholic Church in Ghana owns an insurance company. It's one of the biggest. And the Catholic Church in Ghana is four million strong. To make money, we walked up to them the insurance branch, and model an insurance product for them. Essentially, I can decide not to insure my Porsche because I don't drive it much. And then in March, I'll be driving it, jumping my Porsche, around the corner, hey, Buzz, come. Have you got MTN thing? Give me, I want to top up my phone. Also, have you got those uh, quickie cards? Yeah, give me, yeah. Scratch, put my car number in there, bam, bam, I'm insured. 
done. Now, I don't have to put money out for the whole year. It's monthly. I can decide on and off. I'm in South Africa. I don't need my car insured. Let it be parked. Can you imagine the impact on the taxi drivers who don't have to tie up a year's money? Right? So that got launched today. By the way, to get all these things working, we didn't have money to go and do some big marketing splash. But we had to gangster it. <laughs> so, so what did we do? We have friends who own radio and TV stations. We went in there and cut them in. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't have to tell them to advertise. They want money. They need to advertise. <laughs> I don't know. If they want $100,000, they know what they need to do. I don't need to tell them. <laughs> Apart from that, it immediately means they have diversified. They were doing media business. Now they own insurance business. Now they own uh, even the, the, what you call it, the, the, the Oyster card thing, the Kebaikon card. They own that business too. So suddenly, everybody's happy. And there's no money being spent, but everybody's rolling along. Our interests are all aligned, and we're all, you know, above your uncle. So that's the insurance product. That's home, home insurance and uh, uh, motor insurance, right? So, ah, also, because we're setting up the website on the cloud, even our traditional software business, Softribe, we realize that, wait a minute, we're going and selling these software products, so $10,000 and above. The majority of our people can't afford $10,000 plus server, plus you know, mom and pop shops, they can't. We need to package this thing for Africa. So what we did was, we observed the mobile companies. They make billions in the same poor African market. So we followed their trends, and now they are not the only ones who understand car technology. We do too. We also understand how to do top-ups for our products. They are selling voice. We are selling many other things. So. <laughs> We went ahead and, and learned that this cloud thing is beautiful. We took our payroll systems, all the segments of the market we couldn't penetrate because they were not rich enough. We put our payroll system on the cloud. We said, okay, we're going to have these people access the payroll and use it and pay per use. And we said, whoa, 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 we can do one, one better. We went off and went and spoke to an international accounting firm and, and gave them a subcontract and said, you will run the accounts. We will charge monthly, and we will split the money. And they were like, oh, because they also cannot penetrate that 90% of the market, the bottom of the pyramid. We've just come up with a model that allows them to take monthly payments and penetrate it. Then we said, whoa, whoa, whoa. One, more, one more improvement. We went to our friends who own the fastest growing bank in Ghana and want to become the biggest like yesterday. And we told them, hey, hey, we'll give you a discount, right? If we bring people to bring the accounts to you, will you pay for the payroll to be run? They said, happily. So suddenly, I can walk up to a mining company and say, hi, how many workers have you got? 10,000, excellent. How much does it cost you to run your payroll department? Oh, Herman, don't even ask me. 25,000, 30,000 dollars a month. No problem, save that money. What are you talking about? Are you going to run my payroll? There's a hitch somewhere. No, KPMG will run it for you. <laughs> say, are you sure? I say, yeah. Uh, what's the catch? I said, just put your accounts at this bank. You, you don't even have to keep permanent accounts. Your salaries can go from there and out somewhere else. The bank doesn't mind. Suddenly, it's viable. For the big boys, because they're saving a lot of money, There's, uh, payroll is never late, there's no crime in the fiddling of the books, and it's stamped by an international accounting firm. Right? If they decide they want to pay themselves and not go to the bank, they pay us $2.50 per head per month. But for a big organization, it doesn't make sense. But think about it. For somebody who has 10 workers, which is the average size of a small mom and pop shop, if you have 10 workers, it's nothing. It's $25 a month. You can afford $25 a month. You run your little carpentry shop, and you know, it's a pose. You know, KPMG runs my account. Yeah. <laughs> I made it. <laughs> so these are the kinds of solutions that I find. There, there are quite a few more. But these are the kinds of solutions that I find are coming into our space. And uh, we, are, we are coming up with all these solutions. Note that. With all these solutions, right? We're just starting them. I, I, I won't tell you all the details, and, but there are about 10 more. We're just starting them. On any of them, somebody can say, hey, Herman, I live in South Africa. I want to be your partner. Done. It's the same cloud. It's the same SMS. The SMS doesn't know African borders. So rolling it out into another African country is a joke. We have the technology. 
we experiment with Ghana. As soon as we have it tuned properly, then we call our friends. Hey, hi, you like Uganda? Take Uganda. You like Sierra Leone? Take Sierra Leone. You like South Africa? Take South Africa. This is the African unity as a Pan-Africanist. This is the African unity that I see. It will unite with business. Then the borders will become irrelevant. Then we'll make money. If anybody has any questions, you must have got the general trend by now. This is what we do now. But by, by Christmas time, the shop will start operating, and uh, we'll make some money there too. But for now, we're doing a lot of these things, and uh, pay as you go, and everybody's excited, and the radio is churning out the adverts, and uh, we're all in business. <laughs> so, any questions? I'll stop here. Okay, go ahead. NFC chips, are those the special chips that the telephone companies yeah. use? Well, it's an extra product on, on Is it a product or something? No, no, I'm saying, I'm saying that it's working already. It's a bonus, if you see what I mean. What, what, the SMS is fine, it's, it works already. So to, to get somebody, what, what would be the incentive if we do what we're doing and we do succeed? What would be the incentive for me to go and, and get a special chip? There's no incentive. Whatever I was looking for, I, 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 I used to be a techie. These days, I like to think like an end user. You're, otherwise, you go bankrupt. So I like to think that, okay, what, what will motivate me when I can already do my banking and when I can already do, you see what I mean? Uh, uh, that what will motivate me to go and get something extra? And, and we've done many, many things. Some have failed and so on. And the ones that have failed have traditionally been because we're techies. We're thinking techie. We're thinking this is the way it should work. This is the best way. But you should always look at the client experience, the user experience. And I think in that case, I mean, the telcos have money, so they might push it. But I'm just saying that it will be redundant if what we are doing works. By the way, these transactions I'm talking about, the insurance stuff, I can be in South Africa and get a call from my brother who will tell me that, hey, hey, Herman, my, my, my car isn't insured, and I'm broke, man. Please insure my car for me. Oh, why are you troubling me? I'll sit in Durban, go on the internet, go into Shop Africa, go to the insurance page, buy an e-voucher and text it to him. In fact, while I'm buying it, I can tell the computer that send this e-voucher for the insurance, for the, for the third party insurance, send it to my brother's phone in Ghana. Boom, done. So it's all international. There are no borders. All right, some more questions. Any Please questions? raise your hands, wherever you might be. There's one right mm -hmm. in the middle over here. I hope I wasn't talking too fast. Okay. Well, I'll be honest with you, you've had, us, you've had us spellbound, and I think he deserves a massive round of applause. A gentleman in the middle. <laughs> Hi. This morning, we had uh, a representative from Amazon saying that they didn't have any cloud in Africa, and you are using cloud computing. I was wondering what cloud services are, are you using? OK, I, I argue that. It is typical. As Africans, we know Africa like nobody else does. Uh, when he made his presentation, it was interesting. I agreed with him completely on the fact of cloud computing being useful for Africa, but we differed completely about the reasons. There are two reasons why cloud computing is good for Africa. Because Europe doesn't have, Europe and America, they don't have power failures. One, and two, they don't have bandwidth limitations. These are the two reasons why we will put our cloud. He didn't mention those, but those are the only reasons why we went on the cloud. It, we tried working outside the, without the cloud. We needed to have a backup generator, second backup generator, internet provider one, internet provider two, internet provider three, and I still got called in the middle of the night. Hello, Herman, they can't board the planes. So what planes? The system has gone down. What about the generator? It didn't come on. So, so you have to run. I mean, you're causing trouble at the airport. You're blocking the whole uh, airport. And, and it's because we run a, the booking system that they spoke about. We've been running one for five years for the small airlines and the bus systems in Ghana. And, and when the system goes down, they can't book. Nobody can go. They can't check in. So what, what we had to do in the end, we threw it onto our servers that we, we designed for the Shop Africa thing, threw it onto those servers. Then we didn't hear from the, the client for like three months. So I called him. Hey, Chaka, what's up with the airline? Is everything OK? Oh, Herman, sorry, I forgot to call you. After last time, we've had no problems. What did you do? <laughs> Everything's just working fine. It's very fast, too. And we decided that we're going to cloud everything. So it was actually a real need. Those were the two reasons. But you have to be in Africa to know. You have to be on the ground to know. Any more questions? Yeah. 
many solutions that have, that have come out of various African countries, when they've gone to other African countries, there's often been a failure because of yes. specific cultural things that happen. Yes. And PESA is one of the good examples of yes. how it, it does yes. and doesn't port. Have you started to move between the various African countries? How have you found these things to change? Or you know, are there big adaptions? Are some things that fail completely? You know, is, are there really full African solutions? Okay, I, I hear you completely on the MPESA example. But you know, once again, as far as I know, MPESA is basically Vodafone, which is a British company. When I looked at their model from day one, and hey, I'm no genius, but when I looked at it, I was surprised it worked so well in Kenya. And I thought, hmm, this must be a unique situation. Because when we did our modeling, there were certain holes that we spotted in running a system like that. So we had to model it a completely different way um, and make it telecoms agnostic and make it international and so on for it to make enough money for it to work. Plus, don't forget, we also realized the, the failures that these systems in moving to countries are facing. We also went an extra step. We own the mall and we own the payment system like eBay and PayPal. Most people are just operating on one side. I always say this, they should be careful. Because the day eBay goes crazy and charges a higher percentage on the trade, right? They can start doing the money transfers for free on PayPal. Then what? <laughs> so all the people who are only in the PayPal, PayPal space, my view is that they should be careful. And, and it could happen. If, if people made enough money, they will start actually paying people a dollar for each transfer they do because they make their money on, on, the, on the other end of the deal. But you see, the other end of the deal is complicated. That one requires the, the African bush, Bushman mentality. You have to be able to go in the bush, negotiate in local language. They have to trust you to give you their goods, they pay them later. It's too complicated for an American company to arrive in Africa to do. It will be like some NGO operation. They'll just pay a lot of salaries and the money will be finished in five years. <laughs> Which is why I say, some of these things, it takes an African to do it. You see what I mean? So this, this is my view on it. But uh, I'm quite fascinated at the success uh, that they've had in Kenya. And uh, I'm proud as an African that it was pioneered in Africa. And I commend them. They, they've done a good job. It's not the way I'll do it, but they've done a good job. We've got a question in the front here. Hello, Herman. Yeah. How are you doing? All right, all right, all right. Um, one thing that come across to me is that your mentality in the African market is sort of different from other consultants and other companies trying to come into Africa. They are, not, key, they are not Africans. <laughs> <laughs> you keep saying that, but as a key message, what message do you have for those people trying to come into Africa and to be successful in Africa? Who are you talking about? Give me an example. Um, and I can mention the name of a company, and then I can tell you. Well, any company like KPNG, for instance. Oh, they are in Africa already. They do the accounting thing. PwC is in Ghana, Ernst & Young, the big four, they're there. If you're looking at IT consulting, yes. well, think about it. What they charge, our brothers and sisters, can they pay? No. So they, only, they can only come in with those charges, the, the thousand pounds a day, thousand pound a day charges. They can only come in on some gig from the World Bank to our government. To the, it's a temporary, it's not real business. That's, that's, that's a gig. It's not business. <laughs> they, have to, they have to learn to work at the bottom of the pyramid. The people who I commend, and I say this all the time, is the white boys in South Africa. They understood how to deal with the bottom of the pyramid. Some of the products that I've seen out of South Africa, they, they've managed to work in a poorer African market, they come up with products and systems that work in that environment and are profitable. And I have to commend them for that. This South Africa is where I saw this operation long ago. And these are the kinds of products that work. You notice when South African companies generally move into the rest of Africa, they do quite well. Because they have a, an understanding of how Africa works, which is different from the, the cousins in the West. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't help it. <laughs> Questions? Any hands up? What are the biggest risks that you face mm -hmm. as a person um, with this business model that you have? Yeah. Surely you must have massive risks as well y yes. from other businesses competing against you. Well, there are, but the, the thing is that maybe it's arrogance, but our team, we are Africans. I've lived in Africa for 20 years now. 
I've been doing this business for 20 years. Uh, maybe it's arrogance, but I don't know who can throw out ideas at, at the rate at which we can. There's probably one or two other groups, but there's enough in the market for everybody. And as for the big boys coming into these kinds of spaces, it's, it, the mentality to make such a thing work uh, does not uh, lend, it, the, the, their business practices do not lend themselves to, you see what I mean? You, 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 you can't find, you can't have somebody from Google walking into the market and starting some negotiation with some market women and, and getting some basket weavers association. And it's not the business they are in, they are into search engines. <laughs> they do search engines, they don't do that. You see, half of them, will, I mean, a lot of the companies abroad, who are they going to send? Some guy from California, he'll be afraid of Africa. You see send, too many black people, he'll panic. <laughs> <laughs> And, 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 and if they get one of the, 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 if they get an African from America, from, from Harvard, and send him to Africa, he will suddenly say, you know, I'm an American citizen now. I need to get paid $250,000 a year. I need a house. I need two holidays a year. My mortgage should be paid in America. It has made the business unviable from day one. Because it's an experiment. And it's an experiment that you have to grow over two to three years with very, very low budget. In fact, you know what? If you send somebody like that in a suit to half our merchants, they'll panic, because they'll think, ah, it's the authorities. <laughs> you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Some of them, not all, but some of them. Mm -hmm. hey, but interestingly, uh, uh, I'd just like to make a quick point. Uh, we had some very interesting merchants on the website. Huh? Because we own the technology, we can modify the technology to suit different products. For me, the most interesting products that I've found recently is TV and radio stations are walking up to us. Cold turkey, they don't exist. It's, Two kids out of journalism school, hi, we want to set up a radio station. Can we come on your website? I'm like, yeah, what do you want to call it? Kojo FM. Cool. Internet radio. You go on our website, you pay $10 a month, and you can subscribe to it. And the diaspora, they have their friends already in the diaspora. They will tell their friends by email that, hey, get on my radio station. $10 a month, nothing. So when we start operating, all kinds of non-standard African product. It's an African product. There's some other group that's doing something called African Heritage TV. And ah, this is where the cloud comes in. So we are streaming, but we're not streaming out of Africa. When they upload their movies, they're doing two documentaries a week. When they upload, they don't upload to us in Ghana. They upload to our servers in a, in a good bandwidth place. So everybody can watch from there. You see what I mean? And in doing this, we have to also design some wraparound. So you can pay $2, then you can take the documentary down it will watch a number of times and, and kill itself. So we have to actually invent technology or create technology to make sure that it couldn't be watched more than once. Suddenly, the filmmakers are coming to us and say, hey, we, we hear you've got this technology where our films can't be bootlegged. Can we come to an agreement where we only release it for your Shop Africa thing so nobody else can get it? So these are the kinds of things that are coming up. We can't even predict where it's going. Um, <coughs> two questions. Uh -huh. One, as an African, would you sell your company to a non-African? So would you sell it to an eBay? And secondly, um, so you handle payment, you handle the marketplace, do you also handle the logistics? Completely, yeah. End to end? Yeah, end to end, yeah. But when I say we handle the logistics, once again, it's a gangster operation. I don't, I don't handle the logistics. I know people who are logistics experts. So I went and grabbed one of them, who was my schoolmate, who I trust, and told him, hey, David, I'm going to give you all the logistics. He said, hey, man, if you give me all the logistics, I will drop my price to nothing. And I said, how are you going to do that? He said, because you guaranteed me all the business. I'll go to British Airways and tell them I'm taking a container a day, and they'll have their price. So that's the approach we took. So basically, uh, we created the, the, the platform. is called the MX platform. And it plugs into logistics, plugs into banks, plugs into money transfer, and plugs into merchants. And it works SMS or internet, depending on who has what, that kind of thing. Uh, two, yes, we'll be prepared to sell. I would like for what we are doing to be majority African owned. You know, Africa must own something. So uh, technology is a good showcase it's for our grandchildren to talk and say, oh, our grandparents created this. So on that score, but I'll tell you this, everybody has spoken to me. The question you're asking, all the big boys have come. Everybody, I've told them all to wait. I want us to start operations. I don't want to cheat anybody. We start operations, they see it's working, the numbers are looking good, or at least we see a trend. And then on the basis of that, we will sell. But what I envisage more is uh, we'll take an organization like yours and maybe take 20, give them 
and then we will maybe own 20%, and then the rest we will put on, on um, African stock exchanges across the continent. So every country has an interest in, in being part of it. The AU has, the AU, I have a meeting with the AU and NEPAD. They want to be a partner in this. So we want to make it actually work for Africa so it's owned by Africans. So if, if you're in South Africa, there might be a million South Africans that own shares in it. And not only do they own shares in it, they're also selling their wares through it and that kind of thing. So that's our, we're not against anybody. We just think that Africans must own the majority. That's all I ask. Is that fair? I hope, I, I trust it's fair. Oh? Any more questions? Looks like the word gangster is gonna start trending on Twitter ah. shortly. <laughs> oh my God. I forgot <laughs> My kids will be watching. Uh, right, I think we've got time for one more question. Here we go. Right in front over here. Herman, what's the biggest problem that you've had building a team in Ghana and getting them to a point where you can scale these kind of products so quickly? Okay. How have you done that? H how the hell have you done that? Okay, no problem. It's very, very, very easy. I'm, <laughs> I'm an old dog in the software industry. I've run a company with 90 people uh, pre-cloud and pre-internet. That's what we had to do, because we were installing systems on sites, and when there was a problem and a mine called me and I had to go, and the, the, the 10,000 workers are gonna kill somebody unless we show up, there's a bug in the system, that kind of, we needed to have that many people. You know, it was just hell for everybody. We made some money, but it was just hell. I've been, my, my Mercedes has been turned over, a, a couple of, almost turned over a couple of times, because the workers who don't understand, I mean, and the worst part is, as soon as there's a problem, we do a lot of payroll. As soon as there's a problem in the bush, you think the management is going to say they've made a mistake? They're going to say, it's those software people. When they come, they'll solve the problem. Hello, Herman, we have a problem. We were calculating wrongly before you came. The computer has corrected it, but the workers don't understand. So we've told them it's your fault. So drive in carefully. Seven hour drive. <laughs> and, and, and then I arrive and I'm like, it's not my fault. And they say, don't say it, they'll kill us. And when, when we go, the management is cooped up with security in a room. And, and we are walking and the workers are saying, that's them, huh? You go in, you better so find a solution or we'll kill you when you come out. It's too much stress. <laughs> so <laughs> now, now the model is different. The same software, better technology, all the SQL databases and so on now, they can scale nicely. It sits on a server in a good destination. Two programmers, that's it. This is, this is sit in my office. We are, we are like, the, like the electric company. We are supplying everybody. So if there's a problem, it will come up immediately and it will be fixed. So even if there's a problem, a typical user won't know. It's a sophisticated user that picks it up and it's fixed. And we've got all the time in the world. It's sitting on the cloud. My boys are at home, they're still working. You see what I mean? So I don't need that many people anymore. But in working for 20 years also, we've gained experience. Modeling has become my expertise. If I sat with you and you said, hey, Herman, we have a problem with so and so and so and so. Can we come up with a solution for South Africa? If we sat down in five minutes, I bet you I'll come with four solutions. Then if I call, a programmer from my office in, he's used to being in such meetings because the work does enough. He'll say, ah, Herman, no, 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 I hear you, but uh, there's one more thing you could add. And when everything is over, you should send an email to alert in case they haven't noticed that the transaction has been done on the account. So we've, we've been doing this. We've been eating and breathing this all the time. So it's not like they're geniuses or anything. The genius, I think, is in the modeling rather than the technology. So I, I haven't been programming for 10 years because it's no longer a programmer's game. It's the person who can take, take the programming and turn it into money. Because otherwise, we write programs, nobody buys, the company collapses. We, we've been there before, we've had ups and downs. You say, well, we had good products, but nobody was buying. You say, because they're techie products. Whereas, you know, so that's, that's where the action is. I mean, the programming I'm talking about is not hardcore. I mean, what I've just described, it's not difficult to write the program. The difficulty is, the business proposition you give to the gas station to be a reseller of the card, the business proposition you give to the user, the business proposition you give to the musician, and the simplicity of the system, what it looks like, so that the guys at the, at the trade fair authority find it simple to use. And then when they say, mm, it's still looking complicated, the ability to pick up a phone and call my friend who owns a security company and say, you come man the gates, bring your own security and put cameras. And it's that kind of thing. It's more that than, than the technology itself. So our technology boys have the time they're bored. They're not doing anything. Because and not only that, we've got libraries upon libraries. So putting this thing together, five days. Any of the models, five days, done. Because we've already got the SMS engines. We, we wrote them for Shop Africa. 
we've got the sign-on engines. We've got all those things sitting around. They just reassemble, reassemble, reassemble. I'll tell you the sexiest thing we've done recently. <laughs> because of the Arab Spring thing, right? We, we, I was listening to the radio, and, and I heard that they were using Facebook and Twitter to coordinate all these activities. And then the, the London Spring, the South London one. Yeah, because of that one too. I said, wait a minute, we have armed robbery in our country. It's emerging. We can stop it by using the same technology. So we have. We come up with like a $10 product. Essentially, if somebody bangs your door in the middle of the night and says, open the door, you will do something between your phone, communication between your phone and our server. Do you know what happens next? A security company will head for your house. One. Two, all your neighbors will be told this is what's happening in your house. Now, I don't know about South Africa, but in my part of the world, you prefer the police to the neighbors. <laughs> because they, they will lynch you on the spot. Especially when they think you're coming to the house next. The ones who have dogs will release the dogs. The ones who have guns will start shooting. The ones who have thief, thief, thief over the wall, etc. And then the same radio, sh radio station gangster operation. The radio station will say, today the president visited the UK. Sorry. Carrot's house is under attack. It's number so and so and so. <laughs> Same deal. <laughs> okay. And we've set it up such that you, don't, you never need to come to our office. We learn from the telephone companies, you buy a starter pack from the gas station. And you do your scratch, and you send a text to our server, and we call you. And we ask you what we need to ask you, and put you on the system. You're yeah, sorted. That's launching next week. $10, that's all. $10 eh? a month. Can you imagine now? Everybody can afford. People who never dreamt they could afford security will have, you know, the American ambassador doesn't have that level of security. All he's got is the call out guy. He doesn't have the radio. <laughs> he doesn't have his neighbors. By the way, in, in, in the neighbors, it doesn't ha only have to be your neighbors. Your brother in America, who happens to know the head of police, will also be told. So he will call and say, hey, my brother in Ghana is under attack. Go and save him. And then your friend in the police will also be texts. You don't know. So these are the kinds of things we're doing. $10 a month. Done. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, um, I have no words to say. Uh, I've been so inspired by your speech and by the tweets and by everybody's reaction. You have blown us away. A big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Herman, that was mind-blowing. Can I please buy one of those $10 cards? I'd like to use it in South Africa. I'll, I'll, I don't have the $10 card, but I'll give you one of the oh, thank you. event cards. Thank you very much. Just Ladies and gentlemen, the Bill Gates of Africa. Thank you. Herman Shinari Hesse. Ah, uh, it was simply amazing. You know what? This is, for me, what Tech for Africa is all about. Thank you for bringing a guy of this caliber here, Gary. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I think it deserves a round of applause. Yeah, absolutely.